Hello and welcome, I'm Wolfie and today we're gonna talk about warlocks in TBC, what to look for, how to play one, what to focus on and so on. Warlocks, or usually known as locks among the community, are one of the pure DPS classes of TBC. Along with hunters, warlocks will top DPS meters on many fights. Apart from one of the hardest hitting abilities in expansion, they have the best AoE offensive spell, which we will mention in a moment. Warlocks energy sources are primarily shadow and fire. In some cases, they resort to necromantic. Warlock does have mediocre support towards other classes, but especially towards other warlock, as they work in synergy inside the raid group. It is a perfect class for you if you have affiliation towards specific add-on. Alliance has humans and gnomes as available races for warlock class, which is kinda logical if you think about it. Drain eyes for running from such forces, dwarves are considered more pure Azeroth and less tainted by curse of flesh than humans are. Same goes for night elves. Anyway, I figured that the best way to present races to players is to crunch down numbers to base starting stats. It doesn't have to mean much, but shows the potential of each race in a warlock game. Considering that there is no spell haste nor bonus spell damage, let's start with humans level 1 stats. 22 intellect and 21 stamina. Pretty balanced, but their spirit is 24 points, which equals 19 MP5. MP5 mean mana per 5. Crit chance starts for mediocre 5%. Out of racial traits, humans have diplomacy, which is increased reputation gain by 10%. Pretty useful once you reach part of the game with reputation that actually matters. Perception allows humans to increase stealth detection for a short duration of time. In PvE, it's explicitly situationally used, but in PvP, it's nice to have every 3 minutes. Last trait is the human spirit, which increases total spirit by 5%. Spirit increases HP and mana region, so having a little bit higher spirit is welcoming, but more for other classes than a warlock. Although, in time of Sanval Plateau progression, my would buff everyone and improve divine spirit, which increases your spell damage by 5% of your overall spirit. Now let's head to gnomes. With 27 intellect they have the upper hand on humans, stamina is at 20% and spirit is high 22, but will not grow 5% overly like humans, so in this case gnomes aren't superior. MP5 is also 19. However, with high intellect comes high crit chance of 5.75%, which is higher than any other race on both factions. Out of racial traits, gnomes have increased ar arcane resistance by 10, which isn't as useful as you might imagine. Only fight I can think of at this moment is Caligus, first boss in Stanwell Raid. As we know from lore, gnomes are big engineering fans, so they have increased their engineering profession by default by 15. Other two traits are more useful, luckily for gnomes. Escape Artist lets you break CC once every cooldown and Expansive Mind, which increases your intellect by 5%. That's how gnomes have such high intellect points. Now if we compare them to humans, Gnomes would be my first choice of Alliance Warlock. Being able to cast more times per mana pool plus having high crit chance beats human warlocks. Now for horde races. We have orcs, undead and blood elves as choices. Let's see their level 1 stats. First orcs. 19 intellect and 23 stamina. Surprisingly 25 spirit and 19 mp5, which is mind blowing. I guess by lore they have that unbreakable spirit which didn't falter after their home world planet got destroyed. Their critical chance is by far the lowest of all races, with only 4.55%, but as usual their racial traits are giving them the push they need. Blood Fury acts like Third Trinket at max level, starting with plus 5 spell damage at level 1. Already now orcs have 5 more spell damage every cooldown, but with the drawback of decreased healing. Command gives pets plus 5 damage. In PvE it's useful by leveling, while in PvP it's really good, just like Hardiness, their last racial trait. In PvE it's situationally good, here and there, but not as much as in PvP. Undeads are mediocre in every aspect, such as 20 intellect and 22 stamina, but they are champions when it comes to level 1 spirit, which is 27. From that comes an above average 21 MP5. When it comes to racial traits, they have specific self heal cannibalize, which falls under channel abilities where they can devour humanoid or undead the units within 5 yards to recover some HP. Undeads have no lungs, but can still suffocate, only slower, about 300% slower, thanks to underwater bread, both of these are situationally good. Meh. Warlocks has unending bread buff, which you can buff on yourself or others to avoid this mechanic altogether. Anyway. More useful traits are plus 10 increased shadow resistance and will of the forsaken. Shadow damage is the most used source of magic in expansion by mobs and bosses, which includes by the way the fear itself. Fear is caused by shadow damage, which you can resist if you got increased shadow resistance, either by trait or gear. If you fail to resist, then undead have this amazing ability to escape fear, charm and similar on 2 minutes cooldown. 
Moving to the last race, Bloodoaths. They have high stats. As you can notice, 26 intellect, 20 stamina, 21 spirit with only 18 MP5. Even their crit chance is second highest of all races with 5.60%. On a paper, in a non DPS race battles, they can out DPS other races, even with horrible racial traits. Mana tab plus arcane torrent equals less mana than the life tab, and they are both in GCD, no cast time. So they can use mana tab only to drain mana from target and arcane torrent to silence it. PvP thing more than PvE, since there are million interrupters which can do job with abilities that blood elves have as racials. Nonetheless, this racial is useful on some other classes, like Paladin for example. Beside mana tab plus arcane torrent combo, blood elves have plus 5 to all resistances and plus 10 on enchanting, which isn't half bad, allows you to take this profession from start and actually use it while leveling. That circles faction and race talk. I would suggest going for gnomes as alliance and orcs and on horde side as a first choice in order to min max warlocks in TBC. Other races are just a tiny bit behind but ahead of other classes. But of course, everything depends on many factors such as gear level, experience of class, boss fights, RNG, and so on. Now to move to level 70 from level 1. Talents and what to go for, how some of them work, scale, etc. This is optimized level 70 destruction of warlock spec. In hardcore guilds, there will be at least 3 of these in every 25 man raid setup. You can switch 2 to 3 points around in a demonology tree in order to get stronger imp buffs or stronger improved healthstone. Rest of the talents in demonology are straightforward. In the destruction tree, the most important is the first one. On Shadow Bolt crit, it applies debuff on the target, which increases your shadow damage done by 20%. Starts from 4 stacks and will lose 1 each time shadow, non dot, or channel damage hits, but will reapply 4 stacks upon your Shadow Bolt crit or any other warlocks. This debuff is very useful for Shadow Priests as well. Beside this one, I'll mention Brain, which increases critical damage by up to 100%. Other talents are self explanatory. As for Affliction or Demonology spec, I won't talk much. There are many variants of specs you can find anywhere or even come up with your own, depending on playstyle, but here's mine. Stats you should follow when you're getting up for Warlocks are these. Sadly, Warlock Talent Tree doesn't have talent that increases spell hit rating, so you gotta focus on that primarily. Cap is at 202 points. Yeah. After that, go for spell damage, especially shadow damage if you're gonna play Destro with Shadow Bolt. I always say, leave fire pieces for mages. Next in line is spell critical chance, as you want to crit more to get 20% increased damage on target. It's tightly followed by spell haste, which you should focus on more in endgame content, as unlike mages, you don't have to care about mana with life tab. Stamina and intellect are also important. Best in slot geared at the end of expansion, you will have up to 12k mana and HP. The reason why stamina is important is because as a warlock, it's literally your second mana pool in which you can dip with a life tab. Gear choices and suggestions. There is huge variety of items compatible with each playstyle. I will list down a few for each slot as suggestion which one to go for and try to get, or even craft yourself. Headpiece is already crafted by tailoring. Spell Strike Hood will be your pre raid biz item, but until you can get hands on it, you can do just fine with Magari Ritualist Horns from Magaran Quest called Hero of the Magar as a Horde, or better yet, Demon Fang Ritual Helm from Heroic Blackstalker in Underbog. Necklace. Rouge of Heightened Potential is a nice starter necklace from Shadow Labs second boss, which you can update with Hydra Fang necklace from Heroic Gazan in Underbog. Shoulders are also crafted, Frozen Shadow with shoulders or alternatively if you need hit Mantle of Three Terrors from Chrono Lord Dea in Black Morass. Cloak. You can get Sedek Oracle Cloak from Talon King Ikis in Sedek Holes or you can use PoE Wall Drop Cloak of Entropy. Chest. For robes, I suggest to go with easily obtainable Robe of Crimson Order. Nice amount of hit right there. If you don't have it, there's a weaker version Ocean Eye Anchorite's Robe. Obtainable by finishing, everything will be alright quest in Ocean Dawn Dungeons. Beside these, if you're kind of good on hit rating, you can craft Frozen Shadow Your Robe for extra spell damage. Bracers. There aren't many bracers with spell hit available sadly, but there are Crimson Braces of Gloom from Heroic Omar in Ramparts. Beside those, you can use Shatrat Wraps from the Soul Devices quest in Ocean Dawn Dungeons or any other cloth bracers with stamina, intellect and a load of spell damage from Heroic Dungeon bosses. Gloves. For gloves, you can use set piece Gloves of Oblivion, dropped by Karagat in Shatter Halls. Easily obtainable are Yenfire. Jaden Fire Easily obtainable are Jaden Fire Gloves of Annihilation, dropped by Ambassador Helmo in Shadow Labs. Belt You wanna go for Belt of Depravity, dropped by Heroic Harbinger Skyris in Architraz, but until then, there's a Sash of Serpent Tread dropped by Warlord Kalitresh in Seamwall. Legs 
craft yourself spell strike pants as a pre-raid biz, but until then you can use trousers of oblivion drop by Talon King Ikis in Sadek Halls. Boots, also crafted by tailoring, frozen shadowy boots are giving so much that you have to have them. Until then you can use boots of blasphemy from heroic Quagmarian in slave pants or if you need hit, boots of Nexus Warden from quest The Flesh Lies in Netherstorm. If in need of loads of hit rating you can find it in Ashen's Gift behind the exalted reputation wall with Scenario Expedition. Besides, any ring will come in handy that has either hit or loads of spell damage. Trinkets. Now would be a good time to mention that as a warlock it's better choice to go for Scryer Allegiance than Aldor, cause you can get Scryer's Blood Gem. If you made a mistake you can get a similar trinket from Epo Hunter in Black Morass called Arcanist's Stone. Apart from that, go for Quagmarian's Eye. Beside these, other good choices are Shifar's Nexus Horn from Arcatraz or a jewel crafted figurine. Wand. You can have at least two. One in your bag with spell hit rating like Void Fire Wand or Nether Core's Control Rod, and one equipped with a lot of spell damage or critical chance, like the Black Stalk or the Wand of Netherwing. Staff. The Bringer of Death won't be a bad choice until you can upgrade it later on, with something like Tarok Shadow Staff from Talon King Ikis. Main Hand plus Offhand, in case you opt for Main Hand or Staff, Great Sword of Horrid Dreams or even Blade of Archmage with a lot of spell power combined with Lamp of Peaceful Radiance from Skyris and Architrize, which I strongly suggest to farm, and it's like mini Chronicle of Dark Secrets. After this, any other Offhand is a choice. This is about how much I'm going to advise about pieces of gear you should farm or craft. Take another look at every piece to get an idea of what kind of stat you should go for. Remember that stamina is your friend and don't run from it. Now out of gems there are like 3 to 4 gems you should be stacking on. Of course the red one for spell damage, orange for the spell hit and spell damage, yellow for hit if it's needed that much. Just a reminder that the spell hit cap is for raid bosses, which are 2 to 3 levels above you. And there is a purple gem to activate your meta gem, which should be chaotic skyfire diamond. As for ancients, of course go for spell damage where you can. Subtlety for Cloak, Glyph of Power for a Headpiece, Death Frost is the best engine you can get for a weapon, but you should be fine with 40 spell power. Tailoring Tailoring should be your number one profession to level up. Apart from making gear pieces for yourself at the start of the journey, you can sell plot CDs further on. Apart from tailoring, you can choose your second profession to be either enchanting for rings and extra ways of earning golds, or some farming profession. As always, you can take any secondary professions. Warlock's consumables are simple. Use what increases your spell power. Crunchy Serpent, Poached Bluefish or Blackened Basilisk are most commonly used food buffs, with Skullfish Soup being ultimate min-maxing food which increases your critical strike chance. There aren't exact elixirs I could suggest, nor I used ones. So Flask is way to go. Flask of Pure Dead to be exact. Weapon coating should be either Superior Wizard Oil or Brilliant Wizard Oil if you aren't cheap. As for potions, you can use Super Mana potions, but it's not ideal. Rather waste the cooldown on Destruction Potion after you life tap your mana to full and pop a trinket. As for pets, you don't really actively use one in PvE, except when sacrificing or maybe farming. These are the buffs you get by sacrificing each one. By far the most useful is the increased shadow damage buff by sacrificing Succubus, or alternatively sacrificing him for increased fire damage. Warlock's rotation isn't that hard, as first and foremost you want to summon your Succubus and sacrifice it for extra percentage of shadow damage. Get your fell armor up and start off by putting an assigned curse up. You can then proceed to spam shadow bolts until you are need of mana, where you use your life tap, rinse and repeat when your curse runs out. If there are 4 or more mobs being tanked, you can go downtown with seeds after tank calls for it, but be careful in case there are CC mobs around. Warlocks might not seem like it, but it's one of the most useful classes to have in raids or parties. They bring a lot of particular original spells and abilities that other classes cannot do. First of all, there are so called cookies or hellstones. Then there is ritual summoning of course. A very useful one is master soul stone. Then there are two different curses which you can debuff target with, Curse of Recklessness and Curse of Elements. Warlocks are a very strong CC class as well. They have very strong fear and AoE fear with longer cooldown. And for demons they have Banish and Enslave, very very powerful in terms of progression. Shadow Ward for Shadow Damage Bubble. Apart from AoE fear, Warlocks have an entire arsenal of AoE spells, best being Seed of Corruption. On second place, Little War 
course is Hellfire, and at the worst one is Reign of Fire, which you use only when you get it at low level, never at top level. Curse of Doom is hard hitting dot, but which to hit dot has to be on the target for a minute straight. Lastly, Death Coil, instant horrify plus heal, but on longer cooldown. It's one of the best situational survival spells, also really good for instant interrupt. In terms of Warlock of spec, I won't talk about any other Warlock talent tree, as none of it is viable in PvE, but I'll talk about this fancy thing locks can do, and that's the lock tanking. Few bosses in TBC can or must be tanked by Warlock tanks, best example being Illidan in Black Temple or Lyotras in SSC. Fire Twin in Sunwell can be tanked by either Warlock or Paladin, so it's optional there. When it comes to lock tanking, only modification to your talent, if you don't have it already, should be 3 points in improved imp, because you need as big of an HP pool as you can get. Apart from HP pool, you need to have enough spell resistance, either fire or shadow, depending on what you're tanking. Next important thing is spell hit rating, cause you want to upkeep threat by squaring your spells and boss. The tanking act itself is easy sailing, especially Illidan. Position yourself as far as you can, but away from raid members so you have time in case you get shadow demons in yourself and spam. And there we have it, I think I covered most of the basic starter warlock information you need in order to start diving deeper into number crunching and min maxing on your own. I chose not to talk about the equation of calculating how much percentage spell haste or spell crit chance you get from a set number of respective points. TBC retail was a long time ago and private servers are different from each other. As always, if I skip anything remind me in the comments and if you want me to make another video about endgame gear perhaps, you can request it at the same spot. Don't forget to like and subscribe, it really helps a lot. Until next video. Bye-bye.